Saving the Great Salt Lake is not a story about the drought or about constructing billion-dollar pipelines. Saving the Lake is a story about protecting the health of two million people who live in northern Utah. Streams flowing down from the Wasatch and Unitaw Mountains gather to form the Bear, Weber, and Jordan Rivers. Apart from a few minor underground springs, these three rivers supply water to the Great Salt Lake. Before Utah became a state, water rights were granted to build a network of canals which continuously divert vast amounts of water away from the lake. Many canal companies divert water away from the Great Salt Lake. If only three of them were to close their canals and allow water to flow naturally into the lake, 998 square miles of dry lake bed would be submerged in 12 inches of water. An area larger than Maui could be submerged if the Bear River Canal Company, the Davis Weber County's Canal Company, and the South and East Jordan Irrigation Company were to close. These three canal companies divert over 214 billion gallons of water away from the Great Salt Lake. Due to the Great Salt Lake being a terminal lake with no flowing outlet, high concentrations of naturally occurring arsenic have accumulated on its lake bed. We know the consequence when a terminal basin lake is not covered in water. Owens Lake, a dried out terminal lake in California, annually emits 60,000 pounds of arsenic into the atmosphere. Arsenic is one of the most poisonous elements on Earth. One eighth of a teaspoon of arsenic will kill an adult. Because of arsenic, Owens Lake has the highest toxic particulate dust emissions in the United States. As the Great Salt Lake is 17 times smaller than Owens Lake, it could emit up to a million pounds of arsenic into the atmosphere. It's only a matter of time before the Great Salt Lake's thin, crusty lake bed cover erodes away. Without this thin, crusty layer, massive arsenic dust storms will make northern Utah uninhabitable. Breathing in arsenic dust particulate leads to lung cancer, skin cancer, bladder cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. The Los Angeles Department of Water spent $2.1 billion on trying to stop the Owen Lake disaster, with such measures as applying binders, using sprinklers, and planting shrubs. After hundreds of millions spent, they found that low water flooding to be the best method to keep arsenic from becoming airborne. If the Great Salt Lake becomes like Owens Lake, untold numbers of residents will become ill. Far more will flee the state, property values will plummet, and its economy will crash. Salt Lake City, and the surrounding communities will become a modern-age ghost town. Thanks to the work of Kevin Perry, a professor of atmospheric sciences at the University of Utah, we have some idea of how much time is left before Salt Lake Valley becomes uninhabitable. Currently, 9% of the dry lake bed is exposed to dust storms. For the remaining 91%, a thin, crusty layer covering the dry lake bed prevents high winds from lifting toxic minerals into the air. Over time, erosion will break down this crusty layer. From years of research, Kevin Perry analyzed more than 5,000 samples spaced every 500 meters, comprising 800 square miles of dry lake bed. Kevin Perry's research concludes that 75%, or 600 miles of the dry lake bed, has a crusty layer less than a quarter inch thick. Less than a quarter of an inch of crusty lake bed separates northern Utah from disaster. On one hand, saving the Great Salt Lake is a story of ensuring the economy and health of two million people. And on the other, saving the Great Salt Lake is a story of upholding antiquated destructive water right laws, protecting farming traditions, and being popular with voters. To discover why Utah lawmakers are not taking the necessary steps to save the Great Salt Lake, and why 150-year-old gunslinger water right laws are determining the welfare of Utah, watch part two of this four-part series.